Okay, so the news everybody, of course, has been talking about is Apple's digital scuba diving face mask, or the Apple Vision Pro, if you want to give it its official name. There's approximately four and a half billion Twitter threads going over its very impressive features, so we'll only go over those briefly, but this episode is more of an overview of the whole VR, AR, and mixed reality space. We're going to look at the different consumer headsets that are out there, and if this world is something that you're fairly new to, or you need an update of what's currently available, then this is the episode for you. But of course, Apple entering is definitely a massive moment and makes it pretty clear that this world of spatial computing in some form is the future. Okay, so we'll start by running through some of the headsets that are currently available, what games and apps there are, and how to find them, plus a sort of temperature check on how this whole space is generally feeling at the moment. The Apple News this week obviously gave it a big push in the right direction. We are mere years away from all walking the streets with immersive devices strapped to our faces. But if you are kind of new to this world, then it definitely can be confusing. Choosing what headset to get or what ecosystem to join depends a lot on what you want to do with it, how much of an enthusiast you are or a casual user and your budget of course as well. It's a little bit like buying a new PC, it sort of all depends on what you're going to do with it. And this space is also a little bit fragmented in terms of where you get your apps and your games for your headset. With phones we basically have the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. With VR it's a little bit all over the place but we'll break it down and make it simple. This also isn't going to be a massively technical comparison, more just an overview so you know a little bit more about what's going on and where to start looking. But before we do that, some very quick definitions so we all know where we're at, whatever your level. So VR being, of course, virtual reality, a fully immersive experience where you're in a completely simulated world or game. AR refers to augmented reality, where digital information is overlaid on top of the physical world. Pokemon Go being the classic example of this. Good times. And XR, or mixed reality, kind of blends elements of both, but also anchors virtual objects to the real world and lets you interact them as if they were real as opposed to AR that generally just overlays information, a subtle but pretty important difference. With Apple's release, we're beginning to see headsets now that are able to do all of the above. So that seems to be the direction we're heading at the high tier expensive end, at least. But let's park that for a second and kick off with the simplest, least faff option for getting involved in this world and having a great experience. Because when it's good, it is awesome, even magical, I would probably say. And most people remember their first VR moment, especially this guy. He did. <laughs> Jumping headfirst into his TV and smashing it to pieces. Immersive stuff. So for all their public criticism, Meta have definitely been important in getting a headset into the hands of normal, non-techie people and making it accessible. Also, it turns out that Zuck would probably be any one of us in a fight. He recently completed the Murph Challenge, which involves 100 pull-ups, 200 press-ups, 300 squats, and a mile run in a 9kg vest. Plus, he does martial arts, so I'm not going to pick a fight with him. Anyway, Meta have sold over 20 million of their Quest devices, the most popular being the Quest 2, and it is really fun. Get it out of the box, put it on your head, draw a virtual circle around yourself so you don't run into the wall, and you're good to go. It's $299 currently, which is on the cheaper end, and mainly focused on VR. You also have access to the MetaQuest store for a mix of games and experiences, and there are now over 500 of them on there. You've got your classic family-friendly type stuff like Beat Saber, which everybody loves, uh, Echo VR, even Pistol Whip, puzzle and escape room titles like I Expect You to Die, which is less intense than it sounds and actually really fun, fitness challenge apps like FitXR, chilled meditation or exploratory National Geographic type experiences, and some reasonably solid single player story titles like Lone Echo and the Star Wars Vader Immortal series. There is a lot on the MetaQuest store now, a lot of which is really fun, especially multiplayer, but generally speaking, they are still quite novelty kind of titles. They'll probably keep you entertained for a few hours and be hilarious at a family gathering type situation. For the really serious gamer though, it's probably not the headset you choose. It's not graphically going to blow you away for the most part, with the possible exception of games like Red Matter, Bone Lab, Walking Dead Saints and Sinners, and maybe a few others. But regardless, it is still some of the most fun I've had on a console of any type. And there is the option to link the headset to your PC with a cable or over Wi-Fi. So if you've already got a decent enough PC, you can then run some of the higher end games from it and massively open up what titles are available to you. Steam, the kind of Netflix of games, if you're not aware, have hundreds of VR games. So suddenly this headset becomes pretty versatile and goes up a gear in terms of what you can get. Your PC is doing most of the work and it's a 
slight faff to set up, but it's worth it once you've done it once. I really like the Quest 2. If you're after your first real adventure into VR, in my opinion, it's still one of the best options out there. One thing that it is not good enough for though, in my opinion, is work. There are apps that can do the remote desktop kind of thing where you have giant virtual monitors, which sounds great in theory, but the resolution just isn't good enough to read text for any proper amount of time and be actually productive, even if you feel cool because for a moment, it feels like you're in Minority Report. So that is the MetaQuest 2, but they have of course just announced the MetaQuest 3 launching in autumn later this year. So what's the difference? Should you just wait and get that? Well, well, maybe, probably, it's kind of like do you want the new iPhone when it comes out type thing. For starters, it's more expensive at $499 compared to the $299 for the entry-level MetaQuest 2. The MetaQuest 3 is supposedly twice as powerful and with significantly better resolution and also much lighter. So maybe we're getting closer to using it for work and that kind of thing. But the biggest push on this new headset seems to be for their mixed reality function, which they're calling Meta Reality. They love trying to claim things that they didn't really invent, don't they? As they describe it, these new experiences go beyond today's mixed reality by intelligently understanding and responding to objects in your physical space and allowing you to navigate that space in natural, intuitive ways that were nearly impossible before. Now, we'll talk about Apple's entry in a minute, and mixed reality is clearly going to be important in the future. But Meta haven't really expanded on exactly what we'll be able to do with theirs other than board games and virtually painting our room, which feel pretty novelty things that you might do once. I imagine it would do a more budget job or some of the Apple stuff, big screens to watch films, which actually it might be more enjoyable now with a lighter headset and better resolution. Maybe working on those virtual monitors and some dedicated early new experiences from home, but it's not a reason I would personally buy it for now. It all feels a little bit early at this stage. We did also do an episode previously on some of the best mixed reality experiences that are out there at the moment. So if you wanna get a feel of some of the things that are coming, that is worth checking out for sure. A quick mention, as well to Meta's other headset that's currently on the market, the MetaQuest Pro, which is $999, but no one's really sure why. It has mixed reality functions, but by most people's reports, it's not really that great. It's more comfortable on your head than the Quest 2. It has better resolution lenses, so stuff will look better. It's more powerful. You can track your face for expressions for your avatar. But unless you're a developer or have got the extra cash, I'm not sure why you'd go for this model. So the Quest 2 right now is $299. The Quest 3 is coming in autumn for $499. Or there's the slightly confusing Quest Pro, which is available now for $999. All right, that's Meta briefly wrapped up for now. They are in this race for the long haul, and I've had a lot of fun with my Quest 2, it must be said. Okay, next, let's cover the PlayStation offering. And the key thing here is that you need a PlayStation 5 for this, so you're already $500 down if you haven't got one already. And the new PSVR 2 headset costs an additional $550 itself. But that is for pretty good reason. It's six years since they released their first headset, and this one is a big step up. It's really comfortable to wear, the controllers are great, you do have to to plug it into your PlayStation with a wire, which is always a bit annoying, but you can be confident that everything's gonna work well together because it's all part of the PlayStation ecosystem. Spec-wise, it's a decent jump up from the MetaQuest 2 and probably sits alongside the upcoming MetaQuest 3 quite closely. Things look slick, smooth, bright, and colorful, and it's just generally pretty delicious in every way. But there is one big downside currently, and that is the Sony VR game library. There just isn't that much to choose from and very few killer titles that really show the headset in its full potential, with the exception of Horizon Call of the Mountain, which to be fair does do exactly that and is pretty great. It's a triple A story driven adventure in a post apocalyptic world and showcases why VR, when it's good, is unlike anything else. It's also not just a novelty VR title, but as a game, it has a lot of depth. You have to collect and craft items, there's amazing combat, and it stands on its own two feet, regardless of the fact that it just has cool VR mechanics, like when you're shooting your bow and arrow and you feel like a legend. Gran Turismo 7 is the other big title that Sony have added VR to, and it is awesome. Driving in VR is one of the reasons why being essentially inside the game is just a next level experience. It feels so much more real, the cars look amazing, and it's just another level of immersion. And if you're into horror, Resident Evil Village might make you yourself 
In actual reality, there were a few okay game announcements at the recent PlayStation Showcase as well, and there's plenty of older titles that have been ported across that are fun, but probably more novelty. So what's the verdict on PSVR 2? Well, in my opinion, at the moment, it feels like a great but expensive add-on, and Sony don't yet seem to be massively prioritizing VR titles. There's also no real mention of mixed reality. It does have a pass-through feature to let you see the real world, but it doesn't seem like that is their focus at all. So it's worth doing a bit of research on the titles that exist already, and weighing up how much you want to be limited to those. At the minute, you can't use PSVR 2 with a PC either, so that store is your game list. Great as it is, it's pretty limited. Okay, next on the list is the Pico 4. Now, Pico have been around for a little while, but interestingly got acquired by ByteDance, the company behind TikTok, in 2021. Them being worth over $300 billion, and we've only quite recently seen them drop headsets that are available in Europe, but weirdly, still not available in the US kind of confusing. We won't spend too long on this headset as it feels like a direct MetaQuest 2 competitor. It's probably better on paper, but we now know the MetaQuest 3 is coming and it's not as good as that is going to be. So I don't really know why you'd buy this headset now. Its price is around $350 as a bundle with a game too. The game library is similar to the Quest, but just not as big. So there's no real advantage there. And it feels like they're trying to muscle their way into the European market. Uh, Calvin Harris recently did a virtual gig, which was exclusive to Pico and TikTok. Talk. So maybe we'll see more of that kind of stuff coming. They also have the benefit of being able to promote it hard on the giant that is TikTok, but not in the US because it's not available. And also there's the controversy there as well. So overall, it's definitely a good headset. I just probably wouldn't get it myself. All right, quickly, let's go on to the more enthusiastic gamer end of the spectrum. If you really love VR or want to experience it in its full glory and you already have a great PC, then there's a couple of options that are definitely worth looking at. First is the Valve Index. Now, crucially, you need a good PC for this headset and you need base stations in your room for tracking as well. So it's not really an out of the box switch on a play device, especially if you're new to this world. If, however, you do want some pretty high-end features like a great field of view, really fast refresh rates, good resolution, and you want to be able to play the best games available, then this is definitely a great option. Valve owns Steam, so you have great access to the massive library of all sorts of weird and wonderful and top-end VR games that aren't maybe readily available elsewhere, but the whole thing will set you back about $850. Its main competitor is the HTC Vive Pro 2 another top-end consumer device that gets great reviews by consumers and experts, even better resolution, super comfortable, access to the Steam library, but again, needs base stations in your space at home. The full setup for this will cost you close to $1,500, so things at this higher-end level are starting to get a little bit pricey. Another important mention here is the upcoming world's lightest, smallest, and most comfortable VR headset, the Big Screen Beyond. Now, this is really cool. It's very high resolution. Uh, it's great for movies and working or games as well, but it is $1,000, and it is compatible with Steam VR base station and controllers, but you'll need to buy both of them separately and also have a PC to run it as well. So there are kind of trade-offs there. And lastly, in this category, the HP Reverb G2, which isn't very catchy, but is another great PC VR headset to mention. It's got awesome resolution and it comes in around $500. So one to definitely consider, plus you don't need any base stations here, although still a PC to run it. Now there are lots more headsets across the VR and especially the mixed reality worlds, but this episode kind of focusing on the consumer everyday space. So those are pretty much your top options at the minute. And then of course, Apple entered the market with the Apple Vision Pro and kind of changed everything. So as you've probably gathered by now, this whole VR, AR, mixed reality future is kind of fragmented. Apple have sort of incredibly brought it all together in one device, and it is a massive statement that although this is still early, spatial computing is the future. The keynote is obviously out there to watch, and it is amazing. This headset looks like it's designed for life in general, to genuinely be able to get rid of your computer monitors and work in amazing clarity with the Apple ecosystem that is familiar to a lot of people. Virtual reality is there if you want the immersion, generally as a viewing experience, but the Disney scenes that they played in the keynote were just unreal, really looking into the future of visual experiences and where this is all going. Is it made for gaming with a big game library? No, it has the Apple Arcade with the NBA 2K series as probably the most impressive title, although I won't be surprised when they double down in this area. You've also got the 3D memories, which look wild, being able to see the person's creepy eyes, the dial to choose your level of immersion, the eye tracking and hand gesture control, all of this stuff is pretty groundbreaking and no doubt we'll see some amazing stuff get developed for it over the next few months. 
Will this be the headset that everybody has in their home in six months' time? No, it's too expensive. But will it completely change the game, push the whole industry forward, and show what's possible for the next tier of devices? Yes, 100%. Do you want one? Probably yes. Do you want to pay $3,500 for it? Probably no. So we're at this really interesting point in the whole mixed reality spatial computing journey or whatever you want to call it. It feels confirmed that this is the future, but it also feels like the iPhone 1 era. But that said, we are at a point where it's definitely worth getting involved. There are enough great things to do and you'll have a fun experience that is unlike anything else. But ultimately, there is a choice to make. Do you care about the best performance and experience or can you sacrifice a bit of that for ease and convenience? and what budget are you on? Do you want to grab a MetaQuest 2 for $299 or sell a lot of your other valuable possessions and potentially organs and get the Apple Vision Pro at $3,500 or sit on your hands for a bit and wait for it all to come down in price? That is obviously your decision, but hopefully this episode has given you a good overview and something to share with friends who are beginning to get into this world. As always, we'll be talking more about everything that's going on, including what Apple didn't mention about the Vision Pro in Thursday's video this week. So hit subscribe or follow on your podcast platform so you're the first to know and see you for the next episode.